Eminence, Excellencies, Associates of the Patrimonium, then panelists, friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Let me first thank the leadership of the Patrimonium Sancti Adalberti for having chosen me for the St. Adalbert Award. It's a great honor by itself, but I'm particularly happy for being recognized by an association active in the research of the Central European issues. An impressive report on Central Europe during the Cold War has been contributed by Milan Kundera. In a way, his essay of 1984, The Tragedy of Central Europe, has influenced my own and my generation's writing and politics. The controversial dissident journal Nova Revia translated it from the New York Review of Books and published it in one of its early issues. Kundera says that the nations of Central Europe, Slovenians included, boxed, that is a quote, boxed in by the Germans on one side and the Russians on the other, have used up their strength in the struggle to survive and to preserve their languages. Indeed, in 1869, a Slovenian publisher wrote to a Slovenian writer, and I quote, Slovenians do not have a future. We shall become either Prussians or Russians. End of quotation. The countries belonging to Mr. Kundera's Central European map have been, until the end of the Cold War, in one way or another, dominated by communists and released from their domination due to the collapse of the Soviet Union. It is a paradox for that Yugoslavia, that was considered as a country of better educated communists, changed to democracy only partly and with delay, and at least at the beginning, more violently than the Warsaw Pact or Soviet Union. Of course, three factors have to be taken into account. The great divide between the Catholic and Orthodox components, the combination of two demands, democracy on one hand, independence on the other, and the foreign policy fiction of non-alignment, famous Yugoslav and Indian and Egyptian invention. A few months before independence, the American president asked his European interlocutors, um, American president of uh, 1991, that was uh, George Bush Senior, asked his European interlocutors, presidents and prime ministers of European countries, one question about Slovenia. Is it an ethnic quarrel or a liberation movement? Kundera tells that in 1937, Franz Werfel, in a Paris speech, proposed to found a World Academy of Poets and Thinkers, Weltakademie der Dichter und Denker. The task of this academy, free of politics and propaganda, would be to confront, that's a quotation, the politicization and barbarization of the world. Not only was this proposal rejected, it was openly ridiculed, <clears throat> says Kundera. Similar reactions to artistic cultural proposals were produced by the Yugoslav, Slovenian, Slo Yugoslav and Slovenian nomenclatura until 1990, and even later. Almost the same way, the Slovenian authorities in 1987 ridiculed the journal Nova Revia that published the Slovenian national program. Next year, our communists made fun of the constitution of independent Slovenia published by 
the Association of Slovenian Writers. It was called literary fiction. But in 1991, it became a basis for the official constitution of the Free Slovenia. Some of us have lived in times and under conditions so impressively described by the utmost Czech author Milan Kundera in his essay. Some of us have witnessed political changes that brought Central Europe from tragedy to the, let me put it this way, right side of history. In 1984, Kundera may have been realistic and pessimistic, but he encouraged critical thinking. Slovenian intellectuals may have been romantic and optimistic after the end of the Cold War, but some realism we should keep and store also for our present day and future analyses. My feeling is that we have come to the end of the end of the Cold War, end of the end of the Cold War, and that we should be prepared for more dramatic changes ahead of us. The question is what we can expect after the end of the end. History will not stop another time. Actually, it never ended as predicted by Fukuyama. And we, or our successors, shall face some kind of a continuation. What kind of continuation? Continuation is a magic word and one of the most beautiful phenomena. As far as the end of their career or life is concerned, governments, leaders, people generally prefer continuation. Prefer continuation to breakdown or turmoil or revolution. Until 1991, most Western European leaders supported Gorbachev and Markovic, Ante Markovic, Prime Minister of Yugoslavia, and preferred a continuation rather than a collapse of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. Indeed, it seemed for a while that history, or at least the history as we knew it, was approaching its end. At the beginning, we had containment, then came Kissinger and Nixon with the idea of detente. Then we had the Star Wars, the empires collapsed, new countries also in Central Europe were established, former communist countries joined the EU and NATO. Russia was invited to join the G8 group. Let us not forget that. And the Russia-NATO Council. The eastern border of the West moved east. Almost as if Kundera's complaint, Central Europe is culturally in the West and politically in the East, that's his, his words, was taken care of. The end of the Cold War brought, actually, or is identified with, the dis dissolution of Soviet Union. Dissolution of Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, and also Czechoslovakia. The European Union grew to 27, NATO grew to 30 members. At this point, I would like to mention an important meeting in a Carpathian dacha where, as myself, of course, the CIO, the chairman in office of the OSCE in 2005, I met the leaders of Ukraine and Georgia, Viktor Yushchenko and Misha Saakashvili. They told me that the old, wrong history has ended, and the time we lived in was revolutionary. First, there was the Rose Revolution in Georgia, Next was the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. It would be followed, so they said, by another revolution in Belarus. In the end, the revolution would reach the Kremlin and Mr. Putin. The scenario was nice but wrong. In 2008, in Bucharest, there was a summit of NATO. There, the Americans proposed to invite Ukraine, Georgia, 
and Macedonia to start participation in the membership action plan, meaning that they would be put on the NATO track. The EU leaders objected, and only Croatia was supported. In 2008, Putin took Abkhazia and South Ossetia. In 2014, it was the Crimea. The truce after the Cold War, also called the Cold Peace, was ended. What happened, or might happen, after the end of the end of the Cold War? A lot happened in the almost 40 years between 1984 and 2023, especially after 1990 and before 2008. Actually, these were good years for Central Europe. At this point, I would like to include an observation by another Czech author, Václav Havel. In his book, To the Castle and Back, he reported on the difficulties of the transition to democracy in Czechoslovakia, or Czech Republic, after the fall of communism. He observed the formation of a new business, oligarchic, he called it, class, of the well-connected and well-informed former communist bureaucrats abusing the privatization legislation introduced after 1990. This seems to be a characteristic phenomenon of most former communist countries, a development that is slowly but surely replacing the generation, if you want critical intellectuals, dissidents, initially responsible for the democratic changes and the demise of the old regime. Havel <coughs> expects that after a certain period, a new critical generation would take care of this anomaly. But the main challenges for Central Europe, plus Baltic and East European countries, dwell in the area of international or rather European relations. The challenging story has begun in 1994 with the famous schäuble lambers paper, continued with the Convention of 2002 the negative referenda of 2005, during the enlargement of the 12, and with the white paper by Jean-Claude Juncker of 2017. After Brexit, the core group of the EU is led by Germany and France. These two countries have represented the European Union and European interests on many occasions. Their cooperation and solidarity have been symbolically demonstrated in the European coal and steel community. The common market for coal and steel, for the countries willing to delegate control of these sectors to an independent authority, was established in 1950 by Robert Schumann and Jean Monnet. They believed that a new economic and political framework was needed to avoid future Franco-German conflicts. Avoiding conflicts led to close cooperation and sharing power in the European community and, of course, after 1992 in the EU. The alliance that some people called the German-French train was symbolically confirmed by François Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl holding hands at Verdun in 1984. The Normandy format applied in the process of the Minsk agreements in 2014 was again a Franco-German enterprise. The French anti-Americanism, the German Ostpolitik, the reunification in 1990 and assistance to the independence movements of Slovenia and Croatia created the impression that there were actually two separate trains traveling in different directions. The Franco-German solidarity was really prominent during the years of the tripartite French, German and British Directoire of the European Union. On September 18, a few days ago, a Franco-German working group 
have published a report on the European Union institutional reform necessary to accept new members in or by 2030. The sensitive parts of the report concern the composition of the European Commission, concern the qualified majority voting and diversification of the future of European integration. And I shall quote, before the next enlargement, all remaining policy decisions should be transferred from unanimity to qualified majority voting. The report suggests reducing the size of the Commission's college to two-thirds of member states or developing a hierarchical model. Then, differentiation between so-called lead commissioners and normal commissioners, with potentially only the lead commissioners voting in the college. And, of course, the report divides Europe into four distinct tiers. First, the inner circle. Second, the EU usual members. Third, associate members. And four, the European partners. In the present day situation, a closer political cooperation between the Central European nations and the members of the Three Seas Initiative is necessary. There are at least two reasons for that. The predicted majoritarian voting in the European Council and the solidarity concerning Ukraine, of course, accompanied by a common formulation of the EU-Russian policy. The Central European nations should work together and avoid disagreements that proved to be detrimental for them in the past. On August 21, 1938, on the eve of a major European scandal, so-called Munich Agreement between Hitler and Chamberlain, an indecent political event took place at Bled in Slovenia, then still a tourist resort of the Yugoslav monarchy. This happens to be the same day, 30 years later in 1968, when Soviet Union took over Czechoslovakia. In August 1938, the foreign ministers of the Little Entente, uh, composed of Czechoslovakia, Romania and Yugoslavia, paved the way for Hungary to participate in the destruction of the Versailles Trianon Treaty and contributed to the precarious position of Czechoslovakia. Let me, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, conclude these remarks with a couple of historical and present-day recommendations. First, unwillingness to give up our cultural roots built up over at least the last 10 centuries, our overwhelmingly anti-colonial history, the anti-Muslim experience which has historically contributed to our unity, our problematic relationship with Germany and Russia, and the post-war experience of the socialist camp countries in which we have mostly all belonged. Second, renewal and preservation of nation states, their sovereignty, their natural identity, demographically relatively homogeneous societies built on the cornerstones of family, nation, and common national language. Three, Central Europe, as a family of small nations, has its own vision of the world, a vision based on a deep distrust of history, history that goddess of Hegel and Marx, that incarnation of reason that judges us and arbitrates our fate, that is the history of conquerors. The people of Central Europe are not conquerors. Central Europe is not a state, it is a culture, or a fate, and this is another quotation from Kundera. These remarks and their title, I called, I wrote the title, to be continued after the end of the end, are evidently essentially inspired 
by the Slovenian experience. Hereby, I mean a continuation, maybe I should say a revival of the mentality that had determined our lives during the Cold War, meaning before its end. Thank you very much.